Okay. My name is Carlos de la Torre. I am the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida. And I'm very proud and happy to be hosting this event, Democratic Crisis in Brazil. As many of you know, and I guess all of you know, Brazilian democracy has been in crisis, at least since the impeachment and removal from office of President Dilma Rousseff in 2016. Since Jair Bolsonaro took power in 2019, the level of confrontation between the president, the president and the judiciary, the president and the media, and the opposition has escalated. In this event, we have distinguished Brazilians, meaning scholars who work on Brazil and scholars who are based in Brazil, that will help us to understand what is happening to Brazilian democracy and to assess if there is a risk of a coup d'etat or that Congress could impeach President Bolsonaro. The format of our conversation today will be that I will ask questions to our panelists and they will engage with each other. Then we will also collect questions and comments from the public. And let me start by introducing our speakers and thanking our speakers for being here with us. And I will do it alphabetically. Flavia Viroli is an associate professor of political science at the University of Brasilia. She was the president of the Brazilian Political Science Association between 2010 and 2020. She has published many articles and books on gender and democracy in Brazil and more generally in Latin America. Her most recent volume is entitled Gender, Neoconservatorism, and Democracy in, Ameri in Latin America. It's co-authored with Maria das Dolores Machado and Juan Baggioni. Our second speaker is Wendy Hunter. She's professor of government at the University of Texas, Austin. She studies comparative politics with an emphasis on Latin American affairs. She has done in-depth work on the military in Brazil and the Southern Cold as well as research on social policy issues in Brazil and Latin America more generally. Her latest book is entitled Undocumented Nationals Between Statelessness and Citizenship. And our third speaker is Andrew Janus. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Florida. And he's an affiliate of the Center for Latin American Studies. He's working on a volume on race and political representation in Brazil. So to start this conversation, let's just start with this question. And I will ask Flavia to go first. Please, Flavia, give us a summary of the meaning of the demonstrations that President Bolsonaro organized September 7th, Brazil Independence Day. What led to the confrontation between President Bolsonaro and the Supreme Court? Thank you. Okay, so first of all, uh, hello to all. Uh, thank you, uh, Carlos. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, with Wendy and Andrew. Uh, well, uh, I think we have to look at uh, the uh, way uh, Bolsonaro is really uh, facing many challenges so that we can understand his appeal to a radicalized sector of his supporters for September 7th. So uh, recent polls show that the approval of Bolsonaro and his government has really dropped, uh, well, from one third approximately to one fourth of the voters, approximately 24% at the time. And uh, we have this very challenging context. Uh, 600,000 Brazilians have died from COVID-19 in the country and uh, thousands of others got sick, lost friends and relatives, um, as they saw Bolsonaro denying the pandemic first and then refusing to take responsibility for fighting it. So uh, um, as, as some people might know, he tried to stop state and city governors from acting, repeatedly, repeatedly mocked those who uh, were trying to make it through uh, this tragedy. We, we are still uh, living. And um, economically, uh, unemployment rates are now 14.7%, and they rise to 21% among Black women, just so that you have an idea. So uh, Brazilians are poorer, and uh, millions are starving. It's really uh, um, uh, a difficult time for Brazilian people, and uh, inequalities are really increasing. And the supposed outsider is now holding hands uh, 
to the traditional right. So um, his current allies as well, including military officers, are uh, investigated or sued for corruption, uh, including one of his sons. So uh, in this context, his best bet was to activate his most radical supporters, those who actually adhere to the narrative that others do not let him rule and that he rules under religious principles, values, uh, um, advocating for the family. However, and I will finish here, uh, relying on, the, on his uh, more radicalized supporter, supporters conflicts with the interests of the traditional right politicians who now support him in Congress. And uh, at least in part with the interests of business and financial sectors supporting him. So that's why he had to step back for a while. <laughs> I don't think this is going to last much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Viroli. Professor Hunter? So um, to add to that, um, I see September 7th as having showed actually the limits of Bolsonaro's future. Um, yes, he can mobilize a radical base. The many policia militar were on his side. The violence was limited, however, and the truck strike, and he walked back from the trucker strike um, thereafter. Uh, one thing that I think is very clear is that business used to support Bolsonaro strongly, especially before he governed. But Big business does rely on open roads. They can't have inflation. They can't have supply sh shortages. At the end of the day, business is a pragmatic actor, not an ideological actor. And um, I see September 7th has having shown the rationality of big business and the importance of supply chain working, I, the importance of um, industry, uh, global commodities, keeping inflation down, keeping supplies up. So yes, the PMEs, I'm not, I, I think they are a troublesome force, but overall I'm gonna rate September 7th as a fizzle. Hmm. Thank you, Wendy. Andrew? So I see how Dr. Hunter could recognize it as a fizzle. I would push back and uh, say that September 7th was concerning enough uh, or should be concerning to, to members of the Brazilian public. Um, and the reason I suggest this is because Bolsonaro still showed that he can mobilize a large segment of the population. Um, and while it wasn't necessarily uh, as overwhelming as he would have uh, liked and he would have suggested that it was going to be, uh, it was enough to, to show that he still has uh, a broad, I'll, I'll walk that back, uh, a base of support um, and therefore to, to try and bolster him. And uh, it gives him the opportunity to take that one photo of him in front of uh, hundreds or thousands of supporters and make the claim that he is still ruling for the people. Uh, they still want him in power. He can sort of double down on this idea that uh, it's other institutional actors that are sort of subverting the will of the people. And with respect to um, showing the, the value of, of economic elements in business, I agree that um, this pushed uh, economists against the Bolsonaro government when he suggested, oh, we need to, uh, calling members of the Supreme Court scoundrels uh, and suggesting an overthrow, um, members of even the sort of center prag pragmatists um, suggested that, all right, maybe now's the time that we need to begin impeachment proceedings. He's since uh, sort of walked that back and said, oh, it was really in the heat of the moment. Um, and some of these economists have also backtracked and uh, continue to support him. And I think what this shows is that uh, 
with respect to economic moneyed interest, there's still a lot of fear about the alternative. So Bolsonaro might be bad, um, but I think a number of economists are sort of holding their breath thinking, well, it could be worse. And Bolsonaro definitely recognizes the importance of the economy. Um, lots of his advisors are, are making economic projections about what the GDP would have to be this year and next year in order for him to get elected. And I think um, the state of the economy is going to be decisive in determining whether he stays in power or whether he goes. Thank you, Andrew. Flavia, when did you want to, to respond or comment to what has been said? Well, I think it's interesting to see how one specific sector of a Brazilian economy that has supported Bolsonaro from the beginning now is like taking a distance, uh, in particular after the, the September 7th. Um, I'm speaking of the agro-business and the big producers, uh, which are, of course, dependent on uh, how... Uh, this impacts uh, global uh, patterns of uh, um, exports. And uh, I think there is one thing as well, is uh, we have to remember that part of this agro-business, the big agro-business is of course uh, connected to big corporations. And uh, so it's complex. Uh, it's interesting to understand how they might have different ways to approach uh, what Bolsonaro can uh, offer. So as, as Wendy has said, they are at the end of the day, they are pragmatic, but they are not one uh, block, one homogeneous block. So they, they have different interests. And as Bolsonaro uh, you know, raises his, uh, his bet on radicalized sectors, these different interests are also conflicting <laughs> uh, internally. So I think this is what we have seen uh, as the most interesting effect considering his supporters. Uh, at the same time, I agree with uh, Andrew that the idea that uh, his main opponent at the time, the, 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 our, our uh, president uh, Lula, former president Lula uh, might be the next president and that PT can be back uh, is something that uh, makes some sectors which are not happy with Bolsonaro wait to see what comes next and believe that it's possible to control Bolsonaro, to limit him and uh, you know, deal with his uh, irrationalities. Uh, so I think we, we are going to see from now to next year, we are going to see how these two aspects will you know, come together and see which, what kind of support Bolsonaro might have. So um, if I could say something, what I think about is interesting about this as a political scientist is that the centrist middle class former voter of Bolsonaro is evaporating. However, the system is very polarized. Your choice looks like it's going to be Bolsonaro versus Lula. I think it's interesting to note that, well, first of all, they need each other because um, without each other, there would be no demonization. And that's half of their support, especially, well, it's like three quarters of Bolsonaro's support. Uh, I think it's very interesting that you're not seeing a kind of center-right establishment candidate come forth, or even a center-left establishment candidate come forth. It is the era of populism, and it is the era of polarization. Andrew, do you want to say something on this, or...? I would just say that Dr. Hunter is absolutely right on that. Um, I think that that's the sort of division and polarization is one of the most interesting elements of this current situation. Um, I think some PT elites, uh, workers party supporters would like Bolsonaro to stay in power. Um, Bolsonaro being in power is the, perhaps presents Lula with the best chance of 
winning again if he were to be impeached sometime soon or removed from office. Um, there's that time for uh, the center right to coalesce around someone else. And there's a, a large portion of the population that uh, supports either Bolsonaro or Lula, as well as a large portion that wants a third way. Um, but in the, in the current situation, in the, in the current environment, there isn't really a, an opportunity for some centrist to, to emerge. And that brings me to my second set of questions is how do we characterize or how do you guys characterize Bolsonaro? I mean, Wendy Hunter, who has written a recent article in the journal Democratization on Populism and the Military on Bolsonaro, characterizes him as a populist. Uh, other people like uh, Federico Finchelstein, an historian at the New School for Social Research, says that Bolsonaro is a proto-fascist. And the followers of Bolsonaro see him as rescuing Brazilian democracy from corruption and from elites that have not allowed a Brazilian democracy to flourish. So I would like to see how Wendy, starting with you, Wendy, how do you characterize Bolsonaro and why? I think he is a perfect exemplar of a right-wing populist. Um, and I'm using the definition of populism as mainly being anti-institutional. He either was against the main institutions of Brazilian society to begin with, or else he picked a fight with them and ended up against them. So I'm speaking mainly of the Congress, and it's interesting he was part of the Congress for the better part of two decades, but he really was an outsider within the Congress. He was an insignificant Congress person. Um, he is not educated enough to really be uh, have a Good relationship with the Brazilian technocracy. He is not um, culto enough to have a good relationship with the dip diplomatic corps, uh, which is very professionalized and impressive. He uh, doesn't like the Supreme Court because they're on to him and his sons. Um, so he is, um, I think, par excellence, a, an anti-institutional populist. He also really has the crude nativist um, aura of populism a la um, Pierre Ostegui. Okay, Pierre Ostegui has this whole definition of the low being um, something that rep, um, unites populists on the left and right. He has all that misogynistic, racist, anti-gay, anti-immigrant, uh, even though they're not that many immigrants in Brazil, um, lingo. So I would say he's really a populist. The reason, one of the reasons I would say he's not a fascist is he doesn't have a unified power base enough. Brazilian federalism protects, protects us from the worst of Bolsonaro. Um, governors are strong. We wouldn't have the vaccine rollout. We, I'm not Brazilian, but I identify. Um, Brazil would not have the quick vaccine rollout that has happened in the last few weeks, were it not for governors that have independent power and mayors. Um, so I think the whole political uh, system is, is not unified enough for him to be a full-fledged proto-fascist. If you look at what he's gotten done, it actually is not very much. He has not been able to get through many medidas provisorias. He hasn't been Mr. Legislation. Um, so I think that at the end of the day, notwithstanding the horrific impact he's had on sort of cultural politics and the sorts of things I think Andrew is thinking about and bringing the military into the cabinet and they probably won't disappear easily than in the next administration. Um, I don't think he's been very successful at major legislation. Um, so I think a lot of this is a bluster. And, and that is fat, is, that's populist as well. A lot of bluster, a lot of smoke and fire, not that much real success. 
Andrew, do you want to continue to, to move things around a bit? I, I agree that he hasn't been uh, as successful in passing any sort of legislative agenda. Uh, he ran as a political outsider, and even though he's uh, become president, he's continued to govern as if he's a, a political outsider and um, has shown that he can't really develop relationships uh, within the legislature with, with people that would ostensibly support him and support um, some right-leaning conservative measures, a number of economic reforms. Um, some of the biggest economic reforms that of his successes, uh, such as pension reform, started before he was even in office. Um, you, you could say that they're not his accomplishments. Um, I agree that he is uh, definitely a populist and uh, has sort of presented himself as, um, if not the savior of Brazil, as the only one that can uh, right the ship and everyone is working against him. That's sort of how, he, how he's presented himself. And many, many of his supporters continue to see him uh, in, that, in that lens. Um, so even though he hasn't been uh, successful in, in passing a legislative agenda, he's damaged Brazilian institutions in a way that will, uh, I think, be his biggest legacy. Um, so he sort of put the, the Supreme Court, put Congress in a bind. Uh, if they're going to take measures to remove him from power, uh, it sort of um, facilitates his message that, oh, the establishment's against me. Um, I'm, I'm trying to change up and shake up the system. Uh, and I'm being prevented from, from ruling in favor of the people. Flavia? Yes, uh, I would not define Bolsonaro as a cluster or uh, at first, let me say, I agree with the definition of Bolsonaro as a, a right-wing populist, of course I do, but I think it's important to understand him as a far right leader, to understand which kind of right, of far right, radical right has emerged in Brazil in this recent process. Um, and how anti-politics and anti-PT uh, politics, not, not only anti-politics, but anti-PT politics has um, opened opportunities for uh, a right that acts in different ways and is able to gather a kind of coalition um, towards <laughs> really destroying social rights and not only eroding Brazilian institutions. So I think if we have in mind some of the aspects of um, what Bolsonaro has been doing and how he has been either actively or silently supported by some in his coalition, for example, concerning human rights, um, concerning uh, how he really um, not only performs, but really builds uh, violence as the main acts of his uh, politics uh, in many ways. Uh, so I think we, we really see how um, there's much more than uh, smoke, <laughs> than smoking fire. And uh, it, I think he's a threat in the way the far right is a threat when it gets popular support, not only a coalition that can support him um, the way he has been able to, to have, but popular support, popular electoral support. And it's a kind of support that is based on his defense, of an authoritarian politics against opponents, against the right of opponents uh, to criticism, for example, that's what we are going on in Brazilian universities uh, now, 
uh, against human rights and stimulating violence against black people, against gay people, against women. Uh, so I, I understand that this can all be uh, brought together uh, to define him as a, 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 a right pop, right-wing populist. But I think that understanding how this kind of far right emerged in recent uh, contemporary Brazilian political process is very important. So in my work, I prefer defining him as a far right uh, leader uh, who has brought up uh, a far right movement, Bolsonarismo, uh, which will probably survive him and uh, lets us understand better what was already there, but also what could be built politically, electorally, as the support for other far right leaders that might come. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, we won't answer this, but I want to put on the table. I think Bolsonaro was very much helped by Donald Trump. And the exit of Trump through a legitimate election, I think will hurt Bolsonaro um, in the future. Um, so just wanted to get that out there. Andrew? I'm intrigued. Um, I saw reports that there was the potential for Donald Trump to go down there and uh, formally uh, endorse Bolsonaro. Uh, I'm not sure if that would actually help him in the polls at all, um, but he definitely built his relationship uh, with Donald Trump up to be uh, sort of the basis of his relationship with the United States. And without Donald Trump in power anymore, uh, the prospect for sort of productive foreign policy um, seems to be pretty, pretty low with, between Bolsonaro and the Biden administration. Flavia? Just a very uh, quick comment. I, I, I do think that uh, uh, the elections, the results of the elections, uh, were really negative for Bolsonaro and important for Brazilians and for Brazilian democracy. And uh, just to, uh, out of curiosity, I don't know if you saw that uh, his son, uh, Donald Trump Jr., I think, was here in Brasilia last week, yeah, for the, this gathering of conservative um, activists. Uh, uh, and it's interesting how there is this, this way that uh, Brazilian uh, political conflicts have uh, really brought uh, themes, issues in a language that was not part of the conflicts in Brazil before. So it does have to, uh, uh, a lot to do, I think, with Trump and the outright and the way it's, uh, um, it's pos positioning it, uh, um, itself against uh, globalism and against, uh, the way they see human rights and gender rights as foreign policy. And uh, I, I think this is another thing, but it's, it's interesting how they brought all this and, uh, and they, they present it as part of, as an original part of Bolsonarism and Bolsonaro's leadership in Brazil, but we know that it's part of a broader uh, phenomenon and uh, the connections with the, the, the United States, Trump and all his ideologues. Uh, I think it's very important, really. There really is a diffusion effect going on here. I do think the anti-immigration discourse is a, 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 an important example of this um, because to my knowledge, immigration is not that big a deal for Brazil. It's sort of like, anti-Semitism without Jews. Um, it, apparently in Hungary, Viktor Orban, one of his main deals is anti-immigration. They've barely taken anybody. So this is um, the rhetoric of right-wing populism and people buy it. It seems to have fallen upon some resonance, even though there isn't, you know, when you think of it, right, the immigrants who are going into Brazil are the refugees of a socialist regime in Venezuela. 
Bolsonaro should be welcoming these people and saying, see, this is what happens when you have Chavez and Maduro in power. Um, instead, you would think that it, it's just so reminiscent of some of the U.S. rhetoric. I think it's really striking. But perhaps there is something different in the case of Brazil, which is also this whole attack to gender ideology. And the whole attack to gender that. ideology, which is something that the Vatican has been arguing for such a long time, that you can have a coalition of right-wing Catholics and all of these Protestant groups are against gender ideology, against gay marriage, all of these fears that they are destroying the family. And that's the difficulty with this type of right-wing radicalism and populism, is that you have the basis of that in other parts of not the world, in Latin America. I mean, all of the fear in the defense of the family. Can I just uh, make a very quick comment? I was going to say that. I think gender ideology uh, takes the place that immigration uh, has in the, in the United States and in uh, some uh, European countries. And that as the main, the main idea that is brought to bring fear to the people. And um, I, I define this, what they do as uh, the moralization of insecurities. Like people are really insecure about many things but they have to do with uh, violence and uh, they have to do with unemployment and uh, informal work and everything uh, else that comes with that. But what they say is that the main risk for you today is that your son or your daughter becomes a gay person. <laughs> so becomes gay or it becomes a lesbian. So this is, it's interesting how this has been mobilized and it does has, uh, an important connection with how uh, conservative Christian uh, sectors in Brazil, but in particular, conservative evangelic leaders have supported Bolsonaro and have stood against PT as they see PT as promoting all of this. This would be the foreign ideology that PT and the feminists and the, the gay lobby would be promoting uh, in, the, in Brazil. So I think it's very, very important. And uh, someone said uh, this week, uh, a colleague said, you know, I thought this uh, was behind us, it was in 2018. No, it's not. It's part of how they, figure conflict and it's going to, if we have elections next year, it's going to be there. I'm pretty sure about it. Let me ask a question starting with, with Andrew. I mean, we have been talking about some of the reasons why Bolsonaro was elected, about his base of support. And perhaps you can go a bit deeper into his base of support and why are so, why are Brazilians so polarized? by Bolsonaro's policy, so. So for one, I would say you have to look at the, the time where he really rose to national prominence, which was in the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff. Um, so when Dilma was in power, there was a, a major uh, corruption scandal that implicated her political party. Uh, the economy was doing uh, absolutely dreadful. Um, and then she was uh, accused of using uh, public funds to cover up some, some budget shortfalls. Uh, and Bolsonaro really rode that uh, wave of, of anti-Dilma, anti-PT uh, uh, to the presidency. Um, in those next elections, he sort of presented himself as, as a political outsider who was corruption free, unlike the PT, uh, he presented himself as, as everything that the PT uh, wasn't. So while the, the PT under Lula uh, had presided over a, a time of immense economic growth and um, led to a number of people exiting power, uh, exiting poverty via social programs, um, a number of those people had fallen back into poverty while Dilma was in office. There was that major economic recession uh, and Bolsonaro was trying to say, no, I'm, I'm turning away from the, the PT's economic policies. Uh, we're going to uh, pursue uh, more conservative uh, sources of growth. We're going to reduce 
uh, social spending, we're going to get Brazil back on track. Um, but Flavia also brought up this, this idea of, of evangelicals, uh, which was a, a major base of support for Bolsonaro as well. So it wasn't just uh, people that had been harmed economically or those resentful of the PT, it was also uh, right-wing evangelicals, of, which is a, a fast growing sect in Brazil, uh, highly organized, highly politically involved. Um, and he was able to court these voters as saying, no, um, God above everything, Brazil above everyone, uh, we're going to uh, get rid of this socialism and this godlessness that was the PT uh, reality uh, notwithstanding um, and present himself as sort of a, a Christian to return to uh, the family um, despite his own uh, sort of personal life, I suppose you would say. Um, but it was the combination in my mind of this resentment against this uh, against the PT and the economic crisis, that people were uh, ready for a change. And even speaking to, to people in Brazil at the time of, of Bolsonaro's election, I was actually living there. And uh, a number of sectors were, uh, segments of the population were, if not supporting him, weren't necessarily opposing him like I would expect. Human rights, for example, wasn't sort of a, a dividing uh, electoral issue for a lot of the population that was concerned about how am I going to get money to go to school? How am I going to get money to take care of my family? Could I add something? Please. I think we have to be fair here. Okay. This, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but it's a little stylized for my taste. Let's face it. Crime wins, went through the roof in Brazil in the last 20 years. And the PT had obviously a hard time dealing with this. They were the victims of a strong military and a strong police. Anything they could say wasn't credible. They did a marvelous job at many things. Bringing down the crime rate wasn't one of them. Bolsonaro rode to town on the high crime rate. Murders were going through the roof. He's got an authoritarian shtick. He has an authoritarian past. Has he dealt with it effectively? No. But if we look at the political opinion polls, one reason that a lot of people voted for Bolsonaro was the prospect of having safer streets. And some of those people are poor, and they are not ultra right wing. They were the victims of crime. Yeah, I, kind of, I completely agree with that. Well, uh, I think it's very important to think about what violence means for people in Brazil and for poor people, especially those living in big uh, cities and uh, places such as uh, Sao Paulo and around Brasilia where I live and uh, Rio and Porto Alegre where he had actually his highest rates of uh, votes among the poorest because it's interesting to see where he had this. And, uh, and I think it's uh, obviously there are other uh, aspects uh, of that, uh, uh, but I think it's very important to understand that uh, it's not, on, not only that human rights could not be uh, a reason for not to vote for Bolsonaro. It's also that violence makes people see Bolsonaro's alternatives as uh, something that could, uh, you know, could work. Actually, it has not worked for so long. That's, that's important. And I think that's something about, uh, there, there is something about the idea of order that he brings. So this is a authoritarian kind of order based on the idea of the protection of the family. Of course, we know that this is, uh, um, it's very, uh, it's not really effective uh, considering his politics, his very anti-popular politics, economic politics and everything, but 
this was very uh, many uh, 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 people have showed uh, uh, qualitative research has showed that people speak of order, family, the protection of their kids. And I think we have to look at that because if we pretend that this was not important and that people were just convinced by Bolsonaro's fantasies about uh, Brazilian society, we won't understand well uh, the, the reasons of the, the, the voters. And, uh, and just one thing that we have not brought to our discussion, the idea of nation that Bolsonaro brings with him. Uh, nationalism uh, is part of this idea of order and uh, if PT brought inequality, diversity to the core of political debate, uh, Bolsonaro brings the nation, the Christian majority, and an idea of order that has to do with this Christian nation. I think this is also important uh, if we think of the popular sectors, the popular voters, and uh, why they uh, might have uh, chosen Bolsonaro. If I could just say one more thing on the crime issue, this is an issue about equality also. The industry, private seguranza, private security is one of the fastest growing industries in Brazil. It has been for 20 years. Who can afford private security? The affluent. It is an issue of inequality if public security cannot protect people universally. And poorer segments, lower middle class, poorer people, one of the reasons they voted for Bolsonaro is they felt the PT did not live up to its word on pro equal protection, basically. Um, because if, pu if public security is poor and private security rests on putting yourself in the gated community and having an armored personnel carrier for a car and sending your kids abroad, that, that was not the privilege of the lower middle class. And so I think that I think the left needs to take the public security issue really seriously, um, because I think that helped bring us Jair Bolsonaro. Andrew? So uh, in looking at some of the survey data, one thing that always stood out to me was, uh, is that if you look at support for Bolsonaro, uh, attitudes towards gun control is a significant predictor of whether or not you voted for Bolsonaro, especially among men. Question of uh, if a firearm were legal, would you purchase one? Uh, men who answer yes are much more likely uh, to have supported Bolsonaro. Um, while in office, one thing he has done is uh, reduced gun laws um, and uh, made it easier for, for people to, to legally uh, get firearms. And uh, there's something to be said that there's uh, a plethora of illegal firearms already on the streets in Brazil. And uh, a number of the law-abiding citizenry it thinks, well, if criminals have guns, then I should be able to have one too. Um, and this is one thing that sort of uh, perhaps concerns me uh, if Bolsonaro was to be removed from power. Uh, lots of the individuals that have bought guns, lots of the individuals that have guns, such as uh, military police and uh, military officers uh, are backers of Bolsonaro. Uh, and um, I see there, there being the potential for, for electoral violence uh, in the aftermath of an election, if there were an election. Just one uh, quick information. Uh, recent data points to uh, the fact that uh, there is a double, uh, the, the number of uh, guns, of fire guns has doubled uh, since he began to, to rule. The, the number of guns, I'm sorry, the, the hands of civil um, people has doubled since the beginning of 2019. So it, it's really a lot. And it's something that I think that should worry us a lot. That brings me to a question that I would like Flavia to start. Is can you explain how his war on the media is working? Because he wanted to censor social media. 
It seems he was unable to do that, but he's in war with the media. So I would like to see what are the specifics of that. And that's interesting because, for instance, in the case of Ecuador, Rafael Correa was able to destroy the major newspapers and most journalists have to migrate to the, to the online. Same thing with most of the media in Venezuela. So, you know, what's happening with the media there? And, and also, we like to address the issue of violence or violent confrontation between supporters and detractors of Bolsonaro that luckily we didn't see on, on, the, on the recent demonstrations. I think this is the important uh, uh, aspect, important dimension of how Bolsonaro is uh, getting his support. Um, and I think there are different levels or different dynamics at least. Uh, well, if we think of social media, um, we have to understand, and this is not a particular to Brazil, I know, that we are speaking of coordinated disinformation and the coordinated uh, diffusion, uh, spread of hate speech. These are both important. Uh, the hate cabinet, as it's called, <laughs> includes a very important uh, general, includes Bolsonaro's sons and some of the people who are uh, working uh, since the beginning uh, to spread disinformation and to support the idea that Bolsonaro is not being able to rule. It's not that he is completely incompetent, <laughs> that he has abandoned the party that he was able to make so uh, important in Congress and many other things. So disinformation, hate speech, and uh, how he aims at the control by social media enterprises. It's similar to what Trump uh, tried to do because uh, they actually speak of freedom when they speak of their right to spread hate speech and disinformation. So I think this is important. But if we think of corporate media, uh, corporate traditional media, TV, radio, newspapers, then we have a very interesting um, scene. We have a, a very interesting um, way that uh, is also, uh, I think it's smart how Bolsonaro has acted because he has distanced himself from Global, which is the, the uh, biggest uh, communication um, uh, enterprise and company in Brazil, but he is with Record and SBT, which are also two uh, important companies, communication companies in Brazil. And the... Um, uh, one of the main directors of SBT, uh, the son-in-law of Silvio Santos, uh, the patriarcha of SBT, uh, is actually one of the ministers of Bolsonaro, and they are really inside the government now, and they are really aligned to inform in favor of Bolsonaro, if not to spreading disinformation. So at the same time that he's not able to control all the media, and he's not, in particular, the, 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 the most important newspapers, and he's not able to control global, although global is really sympathetic to his economic uh, policy, politics, to Gadges, to the Minister of uh, Finances, of Economics. Um, he has this other uh, SPT and Hecor with him in a very important way, aligned to him. And social media is strategic. It was strategic for his election and it's strategic now to keep up the conflict, to keep up the polarization as his popularity drops. Wendy? Um, I have really don't have a lot to add to that issue. Okay. Thank I, you, Flavia. I, I found that interesting because Global has changed its kind of historic positioning. It's the first time that Global stands as uh, the opposition to any government. I know. Imagine. Really, really. So, that should say so something. Important. Yeah.
Okay, so let me ask a question about the elephant in the room. What about the military? And let me start with Wendy because Wendy just wrote that article in Democratization. So what are we expect? What is the role of the military? Will they give a coup d'etat? Will they allow for Bolsonaro impeachment? Will some military people become part of a militia as Andrew was saying that there is also that probability? So I think the military, and by the military, I'm now talking about the high command and the, the leadership, which is smart enough to realize they've got to think about Bolsonaro, so they can't go too crazy. Um, nor do I think they want to. They actually watch their public opinion polls. They've, been, they've played a double game. Okay, they have been happy to get posts in the cabinet. They've been happy to be exempt from some of the pension reform stuff. Um, they've been happy to be able to control certain infrastructural policies. But they don't want to be blamed for too much that goes wrong in the government, which is why they didn't like that Pazuelo was the health minister and did such a poor job. They did not want him showing up in uniform when he ultimately testified because they didn't want to be tainted. So th there's a distinction between sort of the institutional high command, which I think has a longer term vision. And I do think if anyone is an adult in the room, maybe one of them is that adult versus the lower ranks um, where Bolsonaro has quite a bit of support. And he is trying to politicize the military to get that division, to reinforce that division. We know that there are huge sectors of the Policia Militar that support Bolsonaro. They aren't enough. They're enough to make trouble. They're not enough to really form a coup. They're unorganized. They don't even think of a serious sort of governing coup with them, but they're, they can make trouble. Um, so I think what is happening is some elements in the high command are saying, okay, we played this for what it's worth, but we don't want to get in too much deeper. So I think you will see some rationalization kind of constraining them. Uh, whether they can hold the lower downs sort of instead is another issue. And I will say, I just don't have enough inside information to know, but I think that's a potential riff point. And also what I don't like about the long term here, the military are not going to go from having half the cabinet positions to having two so I think that's going to be a long-term effect that will be a legacy of the Bolsonaro government and not a necessarily healthy one for democracy. Andrew? I agree that the military police aren't going to be uh, at the forefront of, of any sort of coup should one occur. Um, but what role I think they might play is causing enough uh, trouble or confusion in one particular uh, city or state such that Bolsonaro can use it as a uh, rationale for um, taking additional power or declaring a state of emergency and sort of using that as a, as a sort of springboard to installing the, the military in power. I, I agree with you that uh, the, the military has recognized that some of the things Bolsonaro has done are good for them. They're, they're, they've attained a, a lot more power than they previously had. And with that power comes access to, to capital, uh, benefits and goodies that they uh, haven't had since they left power um, over 20 years ago. Um, and I agree that they're going to be uh, hesitant or reticent to, to give up up some of that, and um, I'm I'm curious what's going on in the in the head of Lula, um, thinking about if he were to come to power, what would that relationship 
what would that negotiation look like? Um, I'm also wondering to what extent the, the military leaders that are in Bolsonaro's cabinet are also looking to the left and wondering, well, what's the alternative to what we have? Maybe we don't agree with everything uh, Bolsonaro does. He uh, makes us look bad in, in a number of occasions, um, but is our current situation far better than it would be uh, under a return to the peak? Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, they have half of the cabinet and they have uh, around six to 7,000 uh, jobs in the executive, in the ministries here in Brasilia. So that's it. Are they going to just leave? <laughs> it, it, it won't be easy. Easy and some uh, some of the the um, some of my colleagues they they understand that they have already been tainted. So the fear of being tainted, of being blamed for maybe they, you know, there are some steps ahead of that, or at least some of them because uh, they are so um, closed and merged now with Bolsonaro. Uh, we have a government which is part military and part of the PP, the, the progressistas, the, the traditional right. And these guys, they are actually getting along, you know, <laughs> They're, they are really, the, the military are really behaving as uh, rational politicians here and they have the, they know their interests. So, and one thing that I, I'd like to, to bring back that was part of Wendy's, um, Wendy Hunter's uh, comments is the about the high uh, command. Uh, there, there were two um, two moments in the last semester that were really interesting. Interesting to think of how they are, you know, how the conflicts are appearing and how they are going around these conflicts to. Um, to, to maintain themselves uh, in government. And uh, one was the collective uh, resignation of the commanders of the three forces. At that point, we thought, well, now this is going to be a very important chiasm. <laughs> They're going to really get some distance from Bolsonaro. But then the three new commanders uh, the three new, I don't know if it's commanders that you'd say of the three forces, it's, it's, is that right? Okay. Commander, yeah, force commander. commanders. Yes, the, the, the three, they are really more aligned to Bolsonaro and they have been uh, making public statements that are really worrying. Uh, the last one that I thought that was really, really worrying was the one in June 9th when they, uh, they, they wrote a public statement uh, authored by the three commanders of the forces uh, against, uh, well, against threatening this, the senators of the, commission, the Parliamentary uh, Commission uh, in, uh, inquiry, uh, because one of them had talked about how the military and the Ministry of Health could be part of corruption uh, schemas. And uh, I thought that statement was really worrying. And I think maybe there we could see them, you know, a little ahead of the moment when they were afraid of being tainted. Now they, maybe they see themselves really as government now. And uh, what threatens Bolsonaro threatens this government and they have really positioned themselves uh, Clearly enough, I think I don't. I don't see the high commanders as the adults in the room for a while. You know what I thought was worrisome. Also, um, they had wanted to. I think it was Pazuelo punish him for um, appearing in a political rally with Bolsonaro. And Bolsonaro stepped in and said, I am the commander in chief, and they backed off. That really broke, I think, a tradition of, okay, yeah, everyone knows we're political, but we don't go to rallies with the president with our uniforms on. I thought that was um, 
disturbing. The other thing that I've heard, so I just wrote an article with Diego Vega, who's a former journalist. So he always knows the Fofoca. Um, and he's also in Brazil. Apparently, the presidenciavish, you know, including Lula, are going around and saying, OK, if I get to be president, I won't go back on the Truth Commission thing. I'll keep your budget intact. They're already offering them some concessions. So, Flavia, have you heard that? Yes, I have. That and more, including promises to keep them as uh, a more central part of government. So not going back to the Truth Commission and uh, keeping some uh, kind of uh, political status, including, I heard, I don't know if this could really happen, including the, the Ministry of Defense, which had been leaded by civil, uh, people since, the, the, since uh, the government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and this was a very important step, and uh, is back to the military since Temer, uh, Temer um, assumed, uh, uh, became president. So I, I think this, this brings us back to how, uh, to the effects of Bolsonaro and to how he's really, Living a very, very serious and threatening um, heritage because uh, the military are now are now part of the game as they had not been since the 1980s. So that brings me to this question, and I will ask Andrew first: Will Brazilian democracy survive? Will it be a total diminished form of democracy, a totalitarian democracy, where the military? have a privileged role. I mean, it seems from what you are saying that there's not necessarily a risk of a traditional coup d'etat, but we're seeing this process of democratic erosion. So how do you ambition, how far it will go? What type of democracy will emerge? Uh, so I think if Brazilian democracy survives, which I sure hope so, um, we're going to see a, a different democracy than than existed before. So Flavia mentioned uh, civil military relations um, where a civilian had been in control of, of the Ministry of Defense um, and that's going to, going to be eliminated. Um, earlier you had asked sort of uh, in your preceding questions about will democracy survive? And one thing I wanna mention that stands out to me at least is I don't think that Bolsonaro cares if democracy survives uh, in, in Brazil. I, I don't think uh, he has a preference for democracy, in fact. I think what he said all along is sort of who he is, that he would like the military to be in power, uh, that Brazil needs to be a country of, of order. And uh, the thing the military uh, did which was bad during the military dictatorship was that it didn't kill enough people. I think those are his, his true feelings and therefore I am under no uh, sort of suspicions that uh, he's going to respect the rule of law as it's been established. Um, I'm hopeful that Brazil will have free and fair elections uh, come the fall, um, but I imagine that if, he, if Bolsonaro uh, participates and if he loses, uh, he will call the elections a sham, uh, say that, that they were neither free nor fair, call out his supporters, uh, attempt to do what, what Donald Trump uh, did in the United States. And I'm not sure uh, if Brazilian institutions are as strong as those uh, in the United States. Uh, and I think even if they are, uh, they will be damaged by that sort of fallout, just as the political institutions in the United States were damaged. Claudia? I, I agree with, uh, with Andrew. I also, of course, hope that our democracy survives. But uh, I, I think of three scenarios. Uh, one in which Bolsonaro, I, I, 
uh, wins actually four scenarios. One in which he wins the election, but I don't think this is the most probable one. I don't think he's, this was the one I was left in aside and decided to bring. So the three ones are one, he loses the election and uh, he, you know, calls out his supporters and uh, this might be violent as we discussed. And uh, he uh, contests the electoral system and the results of the elections and uh, in a Trump fashion. Um, and here, it does make a lot of difference if the military will be uh, with him or not. So I think this uh, one other scenario that I see is that the same uh, right wing actors and sectors, which actually worked to erode Brazilian democracy prior to Bolsonaro, can manage to have some kind of viable candidacy and um, then we will have uh, the respect for the rule of law guaranteed for the result of the elections. But this rule of law is being so modified that we have to think of a more frail democracy, more limited democracy, especially in the respect to social rights, economic rights. But also, I, I wouldn't have time to, to talk about it, but I don't know if you were um, if you are aware of the changes proposed for the uh, electoral code, our electoral laws, the, like this, the whole set of electoral laws, it's right now, it's, it's a, it has been approved in the Chamber of Deputies these last days, and it reduces the control uh, over political parties brutally. Right? It really reduces the control and it reduces the, the scope of action of the electoral court. So this is an example, because this is the right that could be there without Bolsonaro. They don't need Bolsonaro. They need Bolsonaro now, but they don't need Bolsonaro ahead, I think. And a third scenario would be if Lula wins. And I think it's going to be a it wins in, <laughs> he's able to, uh, you know, become the president, because that's a, between winning and becoming the president, I think we have a lot that could happen. But uh, I think it's going to be a constrained kind of government because of everything we discussed here, not only because of polarization, but because of all the agreements that will have happened for him to be elected and to become president if he does. Could I say something? Yes. One word that has not emerged that's an important part of this conversation is the central. This could not be happening if you didn't have this opportunistic group that is willing to support anybody who will give them enough. And um, this is what will keep Bolsonaro from being impeached. And you can bet these same people are going to make all sorts of deals with whoever comes in next time, and that will constrain them too. Uh, just one thing, they are responsible for this uh, proposal of the electoral code, the electoral laws, that legislation that has been approved in the Chamber of Deputies, of course. <laughs> right. So a lot of the focus is on, on Bolsonaro. You know what? They bear a lot of blame, too. It doesn't have the face of Bolsonaro, but they have been in the background basically securing this government. Like the traditional Republican Party in this country with Trump, I mean, or not? Kind of, uh, <laughs> more or less, yes. With some, yeah, yeah, actually, yes. There's variation from worse to less bad. <laughs> <laughs> we have three questions from the audience, but we have dealt with those because one was, what is the role of the Brazilian armed forces in supporting or not supporting Bolsonaro? I think we deal with that. And how committed are the armed forces to Bolsonaroismo? We also discussed that. Or do you see the armed forces as more pragmatic like the business community? But this question, I think we can go more in depth because we, it's a question about this last topic we're talking about. It's from Thais. 
how does democracy deal with the speeches against the existence of democratic institutions? How do the panelists see the recent STF, Brazil Supreme Court, actions in this regard? So, Flavia, please go first. This is so tricky because uh, uh, Bolsonaro and the Bolsonaristas, they uh, supposedly speak in defense of uh, individual liberty and the liberty of speech as they actually systematically attack and uh, try to censor uh, critical speech, critical analysis, um, journalists, uh, academics. And uh, when the Supreme Court uh, takes a decision or a minister takes a decision uh, to criminalize uh, hate speech and the speech against democracy, they, um, they end up, it's so, so, it's so difficult, but because they end up uh, giving Bolsonaro supporter the idea that Bolsonaro is right from the beginning, that uh, he's not the authoritarian. The authoritarians are in the court, they are uh, in the left, they are um, the feminists who do uh, think that uh, hate speech should be banned from social media and etc. cetera. So, uh, I think that we should speak clearly in Brazil about more clearly about hate speech. I think it's not only anti-democratic speech. I think uh, because our, our uh, um, codes do not clearly define hate speech, we can't go that way to say why saying that people should attack the Supreme Court and burn the ministers is a problem, uh, even if these were not the ministers and this was not the Supreme Court. But well, it is the Supreme Court and they are the ministers. So the attack against institutions come as uh, the justification as uh, for um, banning speech, for arresting some people. And I think here we are really in a very dangerous game so it's clear for me that they are attacking democracy and that they are uh, spreading hate speech and that they are eroding democracy in different ways as they do that. But what I think that should be done is Bolsonaro should be responsibilized. They should, how, how do you say that? Take responsibility, how, legally, he should, be held accountable for. Be held accountable. Bolsonaro, the, the, the responsabilization of Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro should be held accountable for that. Instead of, you know, you arrest one here, you suppress uh, the speech of another one there, because we are speaking of the era of social media, of coordinated disinformation, and these things just, you know, they just, uh, uh, they grow instead of actually being limited. So that's what we need. Uh, Bolsonaro needs to be held accountable for his attacks against democracy and for his strategic uh, decisions to kill people um, of COVID-19 these last two years. Andrew? I think the Supreme Court's in a, in a tough position um, as, as Flavia suggested, that if they, uh, if they hold him responsible, uh, it feeds into his narrative. Um, if they fail to, to hold him responsible, they, they undermine their own authority. Um, uh, they're, they're very much in a, in a lose-lose situation. And I think, um, Bolsonaro knows this, um, so I I have nothing positive to say on the subject. Wendy, we cannot hear you, Wendy. Oh. Yeah, um, you know, every time they sort of get closer to him, something happens. Like they were zeroing in on his sons, 
malfeasance and what does he go do? Fire the head of the Policia Federal. And he seems to have enough um, autonomy of action to keep doing these things. I don't know how that is possible, but apparently it is. So I, I, I don't know how this is going to end up, but it's concerning that he would have the power to do this. I will say at the end of the day, I have had to rethink my um, earlier reservations about federalism, but I'm glad the governors have the autonomy they do. I'm glad the mayors have the autonomy they do. Um, otherwise, Brazil would be in much worse state if he had unified power. So a very relevant follow-up from Patricia Sampaio, a colleague here at the center, and she wrote, after listening to you, it is becoming even more worrisome how fragile Brazil future looks like. Best case scenario, there will be a lot of damage. Is there any positive, positive, hopeful movements? And to that I will add, I mean, what can we citizens, scholars, public intellectuals do to stop the spread of this type of radical right-wing populism? Because the answer of some of the followers of Black Cloud more and more is to stop right-wing populism, we need populism from the left. And we also see that among American scholars. And now we need a real true populist, not like that Trump who was not even a populist, but you know, what is the answer? I mean, how, yeah. Do you want to start, Wendy? Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, I ask myself every day, okay, I'm a Berkeley educated political scientist. I've worked on Brazil for 30 years. I don't have a good answer to the question of how does some decent, moderate, boring politician from the center left or center right not have a chance to emerge in this vacuum? Um, and I'm kind of tired of Ciro Gomez. Is he actually going to run again, Flavia? I think so. I think he wants to. Uh, it's not clear if that's what's going to happen, but actually I think he would like to lead the center-right coalition, but this is not going to happen. So I, I think know, he's going I to end know. up running the same way. Yeah. But Wendy, I, I, I think that I understand why a decent, moderate <laughs> uh, center-right maybe candidate does not, you know, get to, uh, you know, because I think they are not able to connect to inequalities. You can you are not you don't speak to Brazilians uh, voter to Brazilian voters if you don't connect somehow. It's not that Bolsonaro Bolsonaro does not speak about inequalities, but he speaks about violence. He speaks about order, and he brings something about these uh, experiences of precariousness of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have this rational center right politicians who speak of uh, economic rationality in austerity terms and uh, you know how are they going to speak to Brazilian people with a country with uh, the kind of inequalities we have in which racism and other kind of uh, kinds of violence are now part of the public debate but they don't speak about that so I think that's and you know I look back at Gilma and her unraveling she never really connected with the Brazilian public either. But she had Lula. I know, I know. But he was not enough to keep her from being impeached. Andrew? Well, I just think about electoral institutions and Brazil has this, uh, two candidate runoff system for for the presidency and um if you're a, a if you're trying to be that third way candidate and you're looking at the potential outcomes you have to imagine that 
A, I'm going to beat Bolsonaro in the first round to make it to the second, or I need to be able to beat Lula in the first round to make it to the second. The list of people that are able to, to do that, that are polling, right. I don't know, even 10 points behind either of them is, is, really, is really low. And uh, you have some uh, politicians that have uh, expressed interest. Um, so Joao Doria uh, or Eduardo Lich. Um, but both of these uh, candidates are also seen as at least in my opinion, um, not connecting with the, the Brazilian public. Doria was, uh, vote for me and I'm gonna support Bolsonaro. And then shortly after the election, he broke with him. Uh, Lich did the same thing. Um, I don't think that, that Brazilians looking at the potential slate of candidates have that uh, third way candidate um, to vote for. Uh, or at least not one that's popular enough. And if, if you look at the math, right, if you look at the math, Lula is polling about 37 percent. I, I don't know, Flava, you probably want, know what Bolsonaro's support is. He, let's say it's about 25, because um, last time I knew he was down at about 25 percent approval. There's no one who's going to get in into that race. You're right. Uh, let's see what this damn PSL fusion we were speaking about before we started. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see what this is about to bring. If it's just uh, focused on uh, being important in Congress and being taken into account in any coalition that <laughs> comes to government, uh, mm -hmm. or if they are really trying to uh, you know, present a third uh, candidate here um, from the, the traditional right and uh, that could face Bolsonaro, I don't know. You know, I think the geography of the race will be interesting too. So the only place where Adaji won was in all the Northeastern states, lost everywhere else. And the, the middle class in states, this, I have to say, this really shocked me, but the middle class in states like Paraná, Rio Grande do Sul, um, education and income solidly predicted a Bolsonaro vote. Some of the more educated ones of those are not going to vote for him again. But so I'm interested to see if they're up for grabs a little bit. The other thing is Bolsonaro is going to pour money into the Northeast in the next year. I just predict he will find a way to pour money into the Northeast. So if he can unstick the pete from those Northeastern states, I think that would be troublesome. And the reason why I think that's really might be a battleground area he interviewed a doctor for health minister. Um, it was a woman, a cardiologist, suggested by his son. But she said, um, she said, there's one condition under which I will be health minister. I basically call the health shots. And he said, do me a favor. I ask you to do one thing. Do not recommend a lockdown in the nine northeastern states. Because uh, he said, that's going to kill me politically. Um, and so she said, uh, that's not the way I do medicine. I'm not going to not do a lock a call for a lockdown because you need those states. So, um, you know, poor people are desperate. They voted for Lula. I'm wondering after four years of auxilio emergencial and who knows what else he's going to pour into the Northeast. I'm a little bit worried about those states. Flavia, I'm sure you know more about that. Yeah. But I, I think that one important thing is that Lula Lula was traveling in the, the Northeast states. This I last saw. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, very important political leaders. Some of them are governors, are senators, are state deputies, uh, federal deputies. Uh, they are with Lula. They are not going to stand by uh, Bolsonaro in the campaign because they know Bolsonaro is quite unpopular in the Northeast. This could change. It could change if uh, this money comes, as you say. But, you know, I don't, that's not what I see 
coming. Okay. That's not why I, th I, I think the Northeast will still be uh, where the PT will have uh, its more, uh, you know, clear and uh, stable uh, part of the electorate. And, okay. uh, and as you said, part of the educated middle class won't vote for Bolsonaro anymore. Correct. I I'm really curious to, to understand if uh, they would vote for Lula. Some of, the, of them say they would. Uh, now, uh, of course, our anecdotal uh, knowledge coming from friends and colleagues, uh, some of them say, I wouldn't vote for any of them if I could. But now that I know who Bolsonaro is, I, I would have to vote for Lula and uh, some, this is not people from the university. It's like other people, like middle class, educated people, and uh, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, but in any case, I actually want Bolsonaro to go down at the polls. I think this would be healthier than another impeachment. Although I wish the election were sooner, because you can do a lot of damage in a year. And especially with the lack of, I mean, he's saying that the system is going to lead to fraud. So like Trump, he's predicting a future where he will lose and he will be the winner and then he can oppose democracy in the name of democracy. Well, thank you very much. This has been very illuminating, a bit depressing, but that's the times in which we are living now. I really want to thank Flavia, Wendy, and Andrew for their time, their wisdom, their patience, uh, their knowledge, and their passion about Brazil and about comparative politics. And I learned a lot, and I truly enjoyed this conversation. And thanks so much. I mean, I know we all are a bit tired of Zoom, but I felt that it was crucial for the Center of Latin American Studies to have a a conversation about what is happening in Brazil and what is happening in democracy and the rise of authoritarianism in Latin America. So thanks so much. Obrigado. Thank you.